Allah نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم to the organizers here at uh, urban village in bangsa in kuala lumpur of this lecture on Dajjal and symbolism and brothers and sisters, sons and daughters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We are small in numbers tonight but thanks to modern technology inshallah we'll be able to reach much larger numbers in different parts of the world inshallah a lecture that is on a topic that is very important Dajjal and symbolism what is a symbol? it is language that is not convey its meaning plainly language that represents something else and therefore has to be interpreted in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilizes symbolism for example a prophet of Allah Yusuf alayhi salam had a dream in which he saw the sun the moon and eleven stars we have a gathering of artists and uh, others here tonight so they're probably imagining already the sun the moon eleven stars what can I do with that and these were symbols the sun representing his father the moon his mother and eleven stars is eleven brothers and then Ibrahim alayhi salam another prophet of Allah and he has a, another vision in which he saw himself sacrificing his son but this was not to be understood plainly and literally because once he had accepted in his heart he was prepared to do it Allah says that's it you have fulfilled the vision and so the sacrificing of his son was a symbol representing something else in my opinion and Allah knows best it is the sacrifice of the Arabs which is about to take place and then most importantly of all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses symbolism to explain his nur his nur, his light he says that بَعْدَ أُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Allah, Allah nur al-samawati wal-ard Allah is the nur of the heavens of the samawat, sorry and of the earth and then goes on to use symbolism to say that his nur is like a hollow space and Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam located that hollow space in the heart of one who has faith and in that hollow space there is a lamp 
I can see the artists at work already with the lamp and the lamp is enclosed with a glass that is glittering like a shining star and the lamp is fueled with the oil of the olive tree here is a remarkable instance of divine symbolism but symbols have to be penetrated and understood and sometimes you need more than the rational faculty sometimes you need more than logic and rationality to be able to penetrate a symbol sometimes you need something called insight spiritual insight and it's not sold in the stock market and so now our subject Dajjal and symbolism and we must begin by introducing Dajjal Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam spoke about the historical process culminating with a period of time which would be known as Akhiru Zaman of the last age and that Akhiru Zaman will precede the end of the world the end of the world will come at that time of course when there is the destruction and transformation of the entire material universe the mountains are going to be like pieces of cotton wool and uh, the earth is going to pitch out of its bosom all the graves all the bodies there will be the resurrection and the judgment that's the end of the world but prior to that there is Akhiru Zaman and in Akhiru Zaman or the last stage there are great tests and great trials and these great tests and great trials are going to culminate with the return of the true Messiah the son of Mary Nabi Isa alayhi salam uh, I gave a lecture on this subject at Masjid al Mujahideen just a few days ago an Islamic view of the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam that return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam would witness the triumph of truth over all rivals the truth which came with Ibrahim alayhi salam which came with Abraham which came with Musa alayhi salam which came with Moses which came with Isa alayhi salam which came with Jesus which came with Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam the same truth no difference one truth that truth will triumph over all rivals and that's how history will end but before the true messiah comes back coming down from the Samawat with his hands resting on the wings of two angels and that is not symbolism no before that happens there is a supreme test for those to whom the Messiah was sent in the first place Nabi Isa alayhi salam was not sent to all of mankind no nope. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam Ya ayyuhal nas 
inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'a O mankind, I am the messenger of Allah to all of you to the American people and to the Russians and to the Chinese and to the Malay, to the Arabs, all of mankind but not Jesus, not Nabi Sallallahu He was sent to the Israelite people, Banu Israel who are the seed of Ibrahim alayhi salam through his son Ishaq alayhi salam through his son Yaqub alayhi salam whose name was changed to Israel and so they're known as Banu Israel when Allah sent the Messiah to them he sent the Messiah in a manner which tested them he was born of a virgin mother and they failed the test when they declared of her that she had committed that monstrous sin of zina and that this baby was a bastard child when I was a billah min hadha. you know that very well and then when the baby grew up to be a young boy and he then performed miracles which they the rabbis could not although they claim to be the elite of mankind they have a special status with Allah and yet this little boy would take mud and shape it in the form of birds and then blow into them blow into them and then by Allah's leave they become living birds and fly away this put them to great embarrassment because they said he's a bastard his life is now in danger so he had to be taken out of the holy land and he spent all his life until he became an adult and then as an adult he came back to the holy land and proclaimed himself I am the Messiah every Israelite knows the subject of the Messiah the Messiah is not only a prophet of Banu Israel but he's more than that he's a special prophet he's a prophet who will bring back for the Israelites the golden age when they rule the world holy Israel in the time of the prophet Dawood and Suleiman Israel became the ruling state in the world and uh, subsequently because they violated the covenant with Allah Allah destroyed holy Israel caused the masjid or temple to be destroyed and had them expelled from the holy land but then came the promise that Allah will send a prophet who when he comes will bring back that golden age and he will rule the world from the throne of Nabi Dawood therefore the holy state of Israel therefore Jerusalem so when Nabi Isa returned as an adult he said I am the Messiah and their response was this is blasphemy blasphemy and they charged him in their court with blasphemy and they uh, ordered him to be executed but they did not have control over the land so they had to ask the Roman government and they demanded execution by crucifixion 
and then when they saw him die on the cross with their very eyes they concluded they were now convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt he could not have been the Messiah why he's dead he never ruled the world <laughs> the golden age never came back the Holy Land is still under Roman rule he could not have been the Messiah and so they're now celebrating <coughs> And the language used in the Quran shows that they were also filled with sarcasm. <laughs> sarcasm. Waqawlihim inna qatalna al Masiha Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. We've killed him, the Messiah, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. This is sarcasm because they didn't believe them. So after they saw him die on the cross, they're now waiting for the Messiah to come. Because they know that Allah is not like, you know who, Washington. When Allah gives his word, he keeps his word. Eh? So they're waiting for the Messiah to come. They're still waiting. I lived in New York for 10 years. And I was meeting the Jews and the rabbis when I was in New York. So I know they're still waiting. Hmm? What they did not know, and what no one knew, until the Quran came down, was that no, they did not kill him. They did not succeed in killing him. They did not crucify him. Meaning they did not succeed in crucifying him. Rather, وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ Allah made it appear that that was what happened. And some of you with a taste for it may want to delve into the Quran to find out what really happened. But what is important for us tonight is that Allah made it appear like that. And Allah then raised him into the Samawat. Don't say heaven. Samawat. The same Samawat into which Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was taken in the Isra and Mi'raj. So he never experienced something called Wafatul Maut. What is Wafatul Maut? It is when Allah takes the soul and does not return it. That is Wafatul Maut. Can Allah take the soul and send it back? Yes. <laughs> How do you think you are here tonight? Huh? Yes, of course. In Surah Al Zumar. Allah says that he takes the souls while you are sleeping. You, you do sleep sometimes, don't you? <laughs> Allah takes the souls while you are sleeping. And then for those for whom mouth is written, he keeps the soul. <laughs> but for those for whom mouth is not written, he sends the souls back for a prescribed period of time. So that is precisely what happened in the case of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. I totally and completely and absolutely reject the theory of substitution that Allah wa na'uzu billah min hadha wa na'uzu billah min hadha wa na'uzu billah min hadha cause someone else to assume the appearance of Nabi Sallallahu Islam and that innocent man was executed, crucified no. but they didn't know 
where he stood alive. They didn't know that Allah has raised him. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam informed us some 600 years later that Allah had created a being and programmed that being to impersonate the Messiah to pretend to be the Messiah impersonate hmm? and so he was called Al-Masih Al-Dajjal Dajjal the false Messiah and when he comes when Allah releases him this is the mission that he will have to pursue in Akhir Zaman to try to deceive the Israelite people deceive the Jews into embracing him and accepting him as the Messiah in order for him to do that he'll have to rule the world and of course ruling the world does not mean ruling every square inch of KLCC ruling the world means establishing a rule which cannot be rivaled cannot be successfully challenged by anyone else that's ruling the world in order for him to rule the world from holy Israel from Jerusalem he'll have to do a number of things and I explained that 10 years ago in this book some of you may have already read the book no 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 you already have the book at home but you didn't get the time to read it as yet <laughs> Jerusalem in the Quran it explains this subject we have this book in Bahasa as well in order for him to establish his rule over the world from Holy Israel from Jerusalem here's what he'll have to do number one he'll have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews because we Muslims we have control of the Holy Land he already did that in 1917 number two he'll have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own 2,000 years after Allah had expelled them from the Holy Land and cut them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world He's already done that The Jews are back in the Holy Land and they've reclaimed it as their own while we were drinking tea tarik eating roti chanai number three he will have to restore a state of israel in the holy land these are all logical deductions so don't ask me where is the hadith please these are logical deductions he will have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews to believe that this is Holy Israel when in fact it would not it would be an imposter and number four which is about to occur it's around the corner number four he will have to cause that Holy is that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world succeeding the United States and succeeding Britain which had preceded the United States that is about to occur we are now located on the brink 
of a series of wars which will culminate with what the Prophet called Al Malhama, the Great War. And that Great War will make the First World War and the Second World War look like peanuts. Because it's going to be nuclear war and most of mankind are going to die. <coughs> Only few will survive. That's the Malhama. So Israel won't have to rule over six billion people. Oh no, there will be much less, a more, manage, a more manageable number of people will be on the face of the earth at that time. It is only when Israel succeeds the United States as the ruling state in the world. And of course for that, you've got to bring down the US dollar. The US dollar is about to collapse. Bring down the US economy. The US economy is about to collapse. Bring down all the paper money in the world. It's bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currencies bring it down that's about to happen and replace it with electronic or digital money we should not under, be under the control of governments no banks <laughs> banks are going to control electronic and digital money and the banking system around the world is one system you cannot be a bank in that system unless you conform to the rules of the system and who controls the banking system in the world the Zionists and they're the ones who created the state of Israel mm -hmm. and so Israel is well placed Israel will also have to wage great wars and also bring down the United States militarily but in previous lectures I have uh, suggested how that will happen when Israel assumes the status of ruling state in the world and Pax Judaica replaces Pax Americana in the same way that Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica at that time eventually a man will emerge in Jerusalem he can he can come out of another place but he will be in Jerusalem when he declares I am the Messiah he's ruling Jerusalem ruling the world from Jerusalem and Prophet Muhammad Islam described him to us he said he'll be a young man he will be a Jew a young man powerfully built <coughs> with curly hair and now we know the curls is at the side of the hair the orthodox Jews wear their curls at the side of the hair this man will declare I am the Messiah and when the Jews accept him as the Messiah he will rub his hands and say mission accomplished <laughs> mission accomplished by my calculation and of course I can be wrong by my calculation we are probably about 25 30 years away from that now and I have spent a long long time in the study of this subject Ilmu al Zaman or Islamic eschatology I have written more books on the subject perhaps than anyone in English in the modern age so we are probably about 25 30 years away from that moment when the Jal will declare I am the Messiah they will accept him as the Messiah but we will know no he is not the Messiah he is the man that Prophet Muhammad told us about. He is the Jal, the false Messiah. I now want to 
distinguish between two terms concerning the judge. One is his release and the other is his khuruj. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is in Medina and uh, Tamim Mudari comes to him and tells him about an event which occurred and the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam then narrates that event and so we have the story from the lips of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam when I analyze it, I come to the conclusion, this is my opinion, and let me give a warning, do not ever accept my opinion, unless you are convinced that it is correct. Show respect for your own rational faculty, study the subject before you accept my opinion. My opinion is that this was not an actual event, but rather a vision. And I can explain to you in the question and answer session why I came to that conclusion. Tamim Madari said that he and some kind of his companions were on board a ship. <coughs> and a storm came and blew the ship for a whole month until they came to an island. When they got off the ship, came on shore on the island, they were confronted by a very hairy beast or creature. So much hair you could not tell which side was head and which side was tail. And the creature spoke and said, I am just a uh, spy. In Surah Al-Hujurat, Wala Tajasasu, do not spy. So this is an island located about a month's journey by sea from the Arab world. This is an island which has expertise in spying and espionage. I don't think Singapore qualifies as yet. Eh? Hold on. <laughs> and then Jasasa said to them, there's someone waiting for you over there at that monastery which is lying in ruins. And so in this island religion is going to crumble. Crumble. It'll eventually be an island of atheists. So they hurried to the monastery, which was lying in ruins. And there they saw this man in chains. His hands were chained to his neck and his feet were chained together. And the man asked them many questions and then declared that I am Dajjal and when I am released I will enter every town and every city I will enter every town and every city but he didn't mention Kampung no <laughs> He didn't mention Kampung. Kampung means, of course, <laughs> village. And I am here in an urban village here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, up to that moment in Medina, the Jal was still in chains. This must have been perhaps in the second or third year after the Hijra. Up to this moment, Dajjal is still in chains. He has not as yet been released. But sometime later, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam suspected a Jewish boy to be Dajjal because the Jal is going to be a Jew and he could be a young man. And the Prophet ﷺ went to question the boy. The boy was rather impertinent in his answers. And Omar who got angry 
He said, oh, messenger of Allah, give me permission. I cut off his head. <laughs> no, said the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. Implying, listen carefully, implying that the possibility exists that he can be Dajjal. Let me repeat that. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. Implying that the possibility exists that he can be Dajjal. But that possibility can only exist if Dajjal has been released. In consequence of which we know that we are given indirectly the information of the release of Dajjal in this event. And if he is not Dajjal, it would be sinful to kill him. And so we conclude that Dajjal was released in the lifetime of the Prophet <laughs> But the khuruj of the Dajjal is something else. For that I must now turn to another hadith. And now we have symbolism. The Prophet said, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, when the Dajjal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day, like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and all his days, meaning all the rest of his days, like your days. This hadith was so pivotally, pivotally important that I got a Malay artist to design the cover of this book. And you see three green three blue circles. The, the circle at the top represents a day like a year. The middle circle a day like a month. And the circle at the bottom a day like a week. A day like a year is different from a day which is like our day. I mean, you need only five ringgits worth of intelligence to understand that. A day like a year is different from a day which is like our day. It is only when Dajjal is in a day which is like our day, in our world of space and time, only then can we see him. But when he is in another world of space and time, can we see him? No. Are there angels in this village, urban village? Oh yes, can you see them? No, you can't. Are there jinn in the urban village? Yes, they are. Can you see them? No, you cannot. So they are here, here with us but because they are not in our world of space and time we can't see them how many worlds of space and time are they oh everybody know they are seven summer what <laughs> everybody know that you were taught that when you were children seven worlds of space and time hmm? and so Dajjal is in other worlds of space and time but here in the first stage and the second stage and the third stage of his mission. It is only when he completes the third stage, a day like a week, only then would he enter into our world of space and time. It is when he enters into our world of space and time that he will be in the form of a human being. 
And when he is ready to emerge, to perform the last stage of his mission, that will be his khuruj. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said in a hadith recorded in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, he said, Umranu Baytul Maqdis. At that time when Jerusalem will be flourishing, center stage, as it is today, Kharabu Yathrib. At that time, Medina would be in a state of desolation, playing absolutely no role whatsoever in Islamic affairs or world affairs. That's Medina today. Thanks to the Ottoman Islamic Empire and then thanks to the Saudi Wahhabi government which then took over. Kharabu Yathrib Khurujul Malhama At that time when Medina will be in a state of desolation which is where we are today at that time the Malhama will take place the Great War which will make the First and Second World War look like peanuts that's coming that's coming but I, I feel that it's going to be a series of wars which will culminate with the nuclear warfare Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia he said that the occurrence of the Malhama at that time when the Malhama occurs at that time Constantinople would be conquered they didn't want us to know this so they changed the name from Constantinople to Istanbul so we'll forget this hadith the conquest of Constantinople is still to take place and this lecture is going to be delivered at the International Islamic University in Gumbak on July 4th inshallah do please come to attend it and then he went on to say Fathul Constantinia Khurujud Dajjal only after Constantinople has been conquered only then will Dajjal come out in person hmm, to complete his mission Khuruj so the release took place a long time ago but the Khuruj is still to take place it's coming and it will not take place until Constantinople has been conquered we now turn to having introduced uh, the job we now turn to symbolism and the job the key absolute key to the understanding of the Jal's strategies through which he will seek to accomplish his mission of ruling the world by the hook or by the crook I don't know whether you have a Malay expression like that is located here in this hadith the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every Prophet has warned his people about the job and the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam has warned his people about the job this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari but I say to you something which no one has ever said before me the Jal sees with one eye his left eye the artist is already at work eh? what can I do with that left eye eh? the child sees with his left eye he's blind in the right eye it looks like a bulging grip but your Lord is not one eye between his eyes 
on his forehead is written the word kafir and every mu'min will be able to read the word kafir whether that mu'min is literate or illiterate katib or ghayru katib whether he can read and write or he cannot read and write he'll still be able to read the word kafir we have inter interpreted this hadith and its symbolism countless times but since most of you have never had any experience of a direct contact with me before your only contact with me has been a place called YouTube <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to repeat it one more time why is it that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu can read kafir but Abu Jahal cannot read kafir, kafir. is there something wrong with Abu Jahal's eyes that he cannot read the kafir let us send him to the eye specialist the eye specialist examines his eyes and reports that he has perfect vision 2020 they call it any eye specialist present here we have a few doctors here but no eye specialist okay well then how come if his eyes are perfect why can't he see why is it that Ali can see radiallahu ta'ala anhu but Abu Jahal can't see is it that is it that Ali is not seeing with these eyes could it be that we have other eyes besides these eyes the modern universities will say what rubbish is that huh Oxford and Cambridge and Yale and Harvard and Stanford and Sorbonne and that's nonsense these are the only eyes we have this is the only medium through which we can acquire knowledge of external objects this is the only means through which we can perceive our eyes beside these eyes we have no other eyes and so beside this avenue of knowledge we have no other this is called a branch of knowledge is called epistemology don't be scared it's a long word but never mind it's the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge and this is the western epistemology that these are the only eyes that we have but the Quran says that in addition to these eyes the heart can see and so the Quran has a different epistemology the heart can see but the heart can only see when Allah puts nur in the heart and as we mentioned earlier nur is not sold in the stock market <laughs> Allah guides to his nur whomsoever Allah chooses and so when Allah puts nur into the heart the heart can see and when there is no nur in the heart listen to the language of the Quran it is very harsh Allah says they have eyes and yet they don't see they have ears and yet they don't hear they have hearts and yet they don't understand 
Ulaika kal an'am, they're just like cattle. That's harsh language. Balluhum adal. Rather, they're worse than cattle. They're more misguided than cattle. A people who have eyes and yet cannot see. And so now we can conclude, at least I conclude, conclude, you will have to make up your mind. That when the Jal sees with his left eye, uh, the Jal is seeing with external sight. And when the Jal is blind in the right eye, the blind right eye symbolizes internal blindness. This is my interpretation. You do not have to accept it. You must first be convinced that it is correct before you accept it. Let me warn you one more time. And so now we are face to face with the beginning of the world of symbolism in Dajjal. Those who follow Dajjal will be inter internally blind. There are lots of cattle in the world today, I can tell you that. There are lots of cattle in the world today, I can tell you that. And as we proceed with this lecture, you'll get the evidence of it. The jar's one eye represents epistemology. The left eye is external sight. The blind right eye is his internal blindness. Those who have eyes with which to see, because they have nur in their hearts, would be able to recognize kafir written on the forehead of the Dajjal. But when Dajjal appears in human form in 20-25 years from now, and he is in Jerusalem, and he declares, I am the Messiah. And you go close to him and look, would you see Kafir written on the forehead? <laughs> no. So those who belong to something called Protestant Islam, you know, they hold on to the literal interpretation of everything. We'll go closer, get a torchlight, <laughs> shine the light on his forehead. Huh? <clears throat> Go check to see if there's any dust on his forehead. Wipe it. No, I'm not seeing cafe written on your forehead. You are not Dajjal. No. Secondly, you are not Dajjal because you have two eyes. <laughs> you have two eyes. I am not laughing and you are not laughing in order to ridicule that Protestant Islam. Now, what we're trying to do is to deliver a message again and again and again and again and again to try to wake them up that your methodology is deficient, your methodology is wrong. No, this kafir on the forehead, as any artist, and we've got so many of them here tonight, as any artist would know, is symbolic. It represents the capacity of the mukmin to look at that which the Jal creates. For example, he creates a civilization. And the civilization comes to be known as modern Western civilization. And the Mokmin will be able to look at modern Western civilization and recognize it to be based on Kufr. As though Kafir is written on its forehead. As though Kafir is written on its forehead. 
Let us now turn to a second hadith of symbolism. And the artists tonight are going to enjoy this. They're going to have a field day. The jal comes with two things. A river and the fire. The jal comes with two things. A river and the fire. But his river is a fire. And his fire is the cool waters of a river. Whosoever falls in his river will have his load of sins increased. And whosoever falls in his fire would have his load of sins decreased. In other words, the river symbolizes Jannah. The fire symbolizes Jahannam. The river symbolizes the road to a life of plenty, to a life of ease, to a life of leisure. And the fire symbolizes a life of hardship, of suffering. Hmm? So uh, the Jal takes the road to heaven, the road to joy and happiness and peace and pleasure, and he makes it look like the road to hell. That's not easy to do. You gotta, you gotta have a PhD in deception to do that. Yeah, not easy. He takes the road to heaven and he makes it look like the road to hell and he takes the road to hell and he makes it look like the road to heaven and so everybody want a US visa there are some who will sell their mother to get a US visa or a Canadian visa or a visa, visa for Sweden or for Britain or for Europe or for Australia or for New Zealand that is the land of milk and honey that is where I can get a job and make plenty money those are the lands of progress those are the lands of success and all the cattle of the world ahead for what looks like heaven itself. I was giving a lecture in a place called Pompano Beach in Florida and some of them in Pompano Beach might even listen to this lecture tonight. And in my lecture, I was saying to them, and they're all Palestinians in Pampano Beach. I was saying to them that your children, your grandchildren are at risk because they can be eating bacon and eggs for breakfast. Lahmul Khindir. And drinking wine with lunch. And my audience started to laugh. And I said to myself, what is this? This is no funny thing. What's wrong with these people? Why are they laughing? When the lecture was over, I asked the Imam, a very nice man, the Imam. Imam, why were they laughing? I'm saying to them, this is the age of your children and your grandchildren. I said they were laughing because it's already happening. <laughs> yes. The Charles River is already a fire. And when they realize it and they want to get out to save their children, 
to save their wives from this godlessness my son is showing signs of wanting to be a homosexual I can't tolerate that let me get out of this land so then the father addresses his family and says we are leaving and the mother says you can go I'm staying and the children said you know in America they say dad dad you can go back to Palestine we're staying here that's it you lost them the child has deceived you what looked like his river was his fire now who wants to go back to Pakistan when you can live in downtown uh, Long Island you can live in Manhattan and enjoy a good life who wants to go back to Pakistan who wants to go back to Egypt who wants to go back to Bangladesh who wants to go back to Indonesia it looks like the fire over there that's the road to hell nobody wants to go on the road to hell and yet that's the road to heaven the reason why Somalia is where Somalia is today is because the Somali people love Islam yes the reason why Kashmir has suffered so much more than others is because the Kashmiri people love Islam that is why Kashmir is suffering hmm? we have a Kashmiri here tonight with us and so this is symbolism the Jal's river and his fire nowhere has the Jal succeeded more in deceiving with his river than in the feminist revolution he has brainwashed the world of women so thoroughly that he has succeeded in bringing into being a feminist revolution and this feminist revolution is taking the world of women into the hellfire and yet they are convinced that this is progress this is the best age that we've ever had there's been more progress for women in this age than ever before in history that is the ultimate deception of the job we now turn to another symbol and I'm only touching the mountain tops you're gonna have to do the rest of the research on each one of these symbols there's an entire lecture of mine on it an Islamic view of the modern feminist revolution hmm? the Jal's modern feminist revolution the Jal will have a mountain of bread the artist is at work already out there, there. what can I do with this mountain of bread will it be the sliced bread or will it be the roti roti naan <laughs> the child will have a mountain of bread and there are those who will follow him knowing that he is the child but they follow him for his bread a mountain of bread symbolizes wealth doesn't it so he's going to accumulate such an enormous amount, amount of wealth the large numbers of people are going to follow him just for his wealth <laughs> and in the process of following him for his wealth they worship him instead of Allah and they go into the hellfire I wonder how is he going to accumulate all that wealth hmm? the Prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam that the age of Dajjal would be the age of kathratu riba meaning 
that in the age of Dajjal there will be the prevalence of riba. What is riba? And how does riba deliver bread? Huh? Rotinan. How? <laughs> I'll tell you how. Uh, one form of riba is borrowing and lending money on interest. Okay? The reason why Allah has prohibited borrowing and lending money on interest is given in the Quran. Allah has made business halal and he's made riba haram. And so a riba transaction is not a business transaction. Why not? <coughs> Why not? A business transaction is one in which you can make a profit or, come on, tell me, you can suffer a loss. Why is the banker leaving the gathering? Call him back, please. Call the banker back. <laughs> a business transaction is one in which you can make a profit or you can suffer a loss. The bankers just left our gathering. Why? Because they know what they're doing. <laughs> when, you, when you lend money on interest, you are immunized from loss. There is no way you can have loss. If there is a chance of loss, then there is a sister of riba called insurance to cover that loss. Hmm? So Allah says, this is haram. This is haram. Because this does not qualify as a business transaction. If you can only make profits and never suffer loss, then you are going to grow richer and richer and richer and richer. And the rest of the people are going to grow poorer and poorer and poorer and poorer. As a consequence, the Prophet said, Aslam, whether the rate of interest, the riba is big or small, it will still lead to poverty and destitution. Hmm? And so because <coughs> of the banking system around the world and money being lent at interest you know something called credit card have you ever seen one credit card yeah and it's a piece of plastic and when you go with your wife to the shopping mall guess what happens <laughs> and you you see this and she sees that I'm not singling out the wife eh? I have my wife in the back there. <laughs> so, he wants to buy and she wants to buy. And the car just comes out and comes out and comes out. And then you're stuck with high rates of interest. And they're squeezing you for everything that you have. Hmm? So, Dajjal is able to do this not only with individuals, but with whole countries, a whole country will be bled to death. There's a book that I'd like to recommend to you to read by John Perkins entitled Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Let me see your hands, all those who've read that book. Good, mashallah, few of you have, but most of you have not. So take a note of it, and you see the Jal at work in lending money and interest to enslave entire countries. And that's how he gets his mountain of bread, and it's constantly increasing. Greece has is it 500 billion in debts huh? 
500 billion in debts? And then the Dajjal has another means, also riba, through which to get more bread. What he does is that he replaces real money, dinar and dirham, here we are, dinar and dirham, which is in the Quran, which is in the Sunnah, which is money which has its value inside the money. He takes that out of the market, he uses the International Monetary Fund to make it haram to use gold as money. And if you make haram what Allah made halal, that is called shirk or the Malay word is shirik. If you make haram what Allah has made halal, that is shirk. And that's what the IMF have done. Even Dr. Mahathir was not aware of it. And after the Jal took the dinar and dirham out of the market, he then replaced it with bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currencies. I have a book at the back entitled The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham, Islam and the Future of Money. It is, only, it is less than 60 pages long. So it should not be difficult to read it. <laughs> Those who follow the Jal, you know, the one that looks like the river, everybody wants a US visa. Hmm? All that they have to do is to get a printing press and get paper and get ink. And they can print as much money as they want. And they can use that money to buy anything in the world they want to buy, free of charge. If there's anyone who wants to challenge me on that statement, I'll be delighted to take the challenge because I've studied my subject. I know what I'm talking about. It's free. You just have to print the paper. So that's a lot of bread, eh? And they're printing the paper like mad now. The banks are in problems, so they give this bank 7 billion. And they give that bank 10 billion. Huh? But when we print paper, have you seen our paper so far? It's the ringgit and the Indonesian rupiah and the Bangladeshi taka and the Pakistani rupiah, rupee, and the Egyptian pound, and the Turkish lira. When we print our paper, we have the same printing press, the same paper, the same ink, because we buy it from them, you know. <laughs> but when we print our paper, and sometimes we don't have to print it ourselves, we pay them to print it for us. Authentic stuff, eh? And they print it for us and they send it to us. But when we take this paper to Manhattan, we cannot buy even a cup of coffee with it. Huh? Not even copio. <laughs> it makes us look like a bunch of donkeys. The Dajjal has given us a monetary system <laughs> which is unjust and is ripping us off and so his mountain of bread is constantly increasing who is to be blamed for this answer the one-eyed people who have eyes and yet cannot see amongst them who have the greatest blame of all answer the scholars of islam the scholars of Islam have failed miserably, colossally. And that is why we are in the mess in which we are now. And because I speak these words, there are so many masajid, they don't want Imran Hussein. 
The Prophet والسلام, that's the mountain of bread. The Prophet والسلام, had a vision. And in this vision, he saw Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the true Messiah, making tawaf around the Kaaba. And he was between two men. And he described Nabi Isa alayhi salam with his hair, long hair, as though water is dripping from the hair. And then, after a while, he saw another man making tawaf around the Kaaba. <coughs> and he also had two men beside him, imitating the true Messiah. But he was Dajjal. You gotta put on your thinking cap now. What does a vision of the Jal making tawaf around the Kaaba, what does it symbolize? Answer. 1400 years ago, we knew that Mecca and Medina, the Haramain and the Hajj, will one day be under the Jal's control. And that's where they are today. The Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Haramain and the Hajj today is on behalf of the Jal. Saudi Arabia is now one of Israel's most strategic allies. And so we have important symbolism with which to help us explain our contemporary predicament. The Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam that the earth would deliver its treasures to Dajjal. The earth would deliver its treasures to Dajjal. About a hundred and a hundred and thirty years ago perhaps a child was playing in southern Africa and stumbled across a stone. The child picked it up. It looked pretty. Took it to her to the home and the father gave it to his father. The father looked at the stone and said, this looks interesting. So he took it to the, to the commissioner, South African commissioner of that area. The South African commissioner took the stone, sent it to Johannesburg. And in Johannesburg, they declared that this is the biggest diamond that has ever been discovered. As soon as that news reached the world, the rush began. The rush began. And the people descended upon that southern Africa, southern part of southern Africa, from all over. But the Zionists were up front with their money. And then began the search for diamonds. But the diamonds are not located on the surface of the earth. That stone was meant to tell you the diamonds are there. But to go down to the bottom of the earth and locate what is known as a diamond vein, like the veins in your body, you need a certain technology. And only Dajjal had that, modern Western civilization. They're the only ones that had it. And so they used their technology using black African labor. And when they paid the black African laborers to dig, 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 they didn't pay in gold and silver, they paid in paper. <laughs> Until they located the diamond veins. The, lo the one with the biggest of all was in a place called, does anyone know? 
Kimberley is correct. The Kimberley diamonds. You will know when you get married and your wife wants a diamond ring. <laughs> the Kimberley diamonds. I went, my wife and I went to Kimberley ourselves. And we went to that big hole. It is so big you could put about five jumbo jets inside of that hole. That's how big it is. And at the side of the hole there were wheelbarrows. Five wheelbarrows. And these wheelbarrows were filled with plastic nuggets to indicate to us the quantity of diamonds that came out. Those diamonds, thanks to a man named John Cecil Rhodes, who was backed by money from the Rothschilds in Europe, those diamonds made their way very safely to the Zionists in Europe. And they then sold them, cut them, polished them, sold them, and made a huge fortune, a mountain of bread. And it was that with that money that they were able to finance both sides of the First World War. And the First World War gave them the Holy Land. But there is a hadith, it's not only diamond, it's also gold. Wherever in the world gold was discovered, they're there to take control of that gold. But there's something else that came out of the earth. More important than diamonds. More important than gold. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, that the river Euphrates is in Iraq, isn't it? The river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. That's symbolism. A mountain of gold. And people will fight over it. And 99 out of every 100 will be killed. And everyone will be saying, I will be one who will be saved. Indicating that this will not be conventional warfare. Because conventional warfare does not kill 99 out of every 100. This has to be warfare involving weapons of mass destruction. Hmm? And this will be a war in which no one will be certain that they would win. <laughs> No one, because nobody knows who's going to be the one to survive. But he said that the believers must not touch that gold. The believers must not touch that gold. My understanding is that this is symbolism. And no mountain of gold is going to come out of the river. But rather that the mountain of gold has already come from underneath the river. Meaning that entire basin in which the mouth of the river Euphrates is located. The Persian Gulf, the Arab say the Arab Gulf. And it is oil. It is oil. It is sometimes called black, black gold. Hmm? And the reason why the Prophet ﷺ referred to that oil as gold, as a mountain of gold, because it's going to be a huge quantity of oil. But the reason why he referred to it as gold is because gold's primary function is that of money. And the oil is symbolized with gold because the oil is going to function as money. While we were eating roti chanai and drinking te tari, Henry Kissinger <laughs> was at work. They knew that the war of 1973 was coming. They knew. And they were able to play both sides in that war because they had Sadat on their side. 
and they're able to bring a conclusion to that war that was advantageous to them, the Zionists. They knew perhaps that Faisal was going to impose an oil boycott and they were happy, probably they fed him with that idea. And when the oil boycott was enforced, it resulted in a 400% perhaps increase in the price of oil overnight. And within one week, the US dollar collapsed by 400%. From 40 US dollars for one ounce of gold to 160 US for one ounce of gold. Mm -hmm. And so the Arabs opened their eyes. My gosh, our oil revenue has just increased by 400% because of the oil boycott. It was at that time that the United States sprang the trap. Two years earlier, France, under the provisions of the International Monetary Fund, which made it obligatory for the United States to redeem dollars for gold at $35 an ounce, international law. France attempted to get some three billion US dollars redeemed into gold. And Nixon then tore up the agreement and said, no, we're not going to do it. We gave our word, we don't have to keep our word. We gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. We gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. And so the United States dollar is no longer pegged to gold at $35 an ounce. If it remains like this, any good knock and the whole thing will collapse. They need something to replace. What could it be? It was at this time when the oil boycott had caused the price of oil to triple and quadruple that Henry Kissinger made his trip to Riyadh <laughs> and convinced Faisal Rahimahullah convinced Faisal that you can make much much more money with oil you'll be selling your oil for a hundred dollars a barrel not just eight dollars a barrel and Kissinger was right yes you're going to have so much money that a man would want to give zakat and he would not be able to find anybody to accept his zakat. Do you remember that hadith? All that you have to do, King Faisal, all that you have to do is to sell your oil for US dollars. <laughs> That's all. Sell your oil for US dollars. That's all. And get all the other Arab oil producing countries to do the same. And then get OPEC to adopt this position. And it succeeded. The Arabs now got a windfall with dollars flowing into their pockets. Huge amounts of money. And when Israel wages the wars that are coming up, the amount of money flowing to the Arab oil producers is going to climb even more and more and more. Kissinger was correct. But in the process, the US dollar is now guaranteed. It cannot fail because it is backed by oil. since oil is the largest commodity traded in the world market every single oil importing country in the world has to make sure that you have a large amount of reserves in US dollars to be able to buy the oil and then from oil from the US dollar as the only currency with which you can buy oil the US dollar then became the trading currency you want to send money 
from Malaysia to Pakistan, you cannot send it in ringgits. No, tabule. Oh, why can't I send money from Pakistan, from Malaysia to Pakistan in ringgits? What's wrong? Is the banking system so stupid? Does the banking system not have intelligent people that they could handle a transaction from ringgits to rupiah? No, you can't do that, Tabule. You have to send the money in US dollars or something called hard currency. That's what the banking system is there for. And so, to conclude, the Khalis, the prophecy in the Khalis was fulfilled in 1973 when the US dollar became known as the, help me somebody, petrodollar is correct. The petrodollar for oil is now functioning as gold. Here is a remarkable example of symbolism in the Hadith connected with the job, which has to be interpreted. There are more. The Jal is going to come riding on a donkey. The donkey will travel as fast as the clouds. The donkey will have its two ears stretched out wide. <coughs> A flying donkey with its ears stretched out wide? Now I think our artists over here tonight are going to have a field day with this symbolism. A flying donkey with his ears stretched out wide. I hope you don't get a problem with your government, eh? A flying donkey with his ears stretched out wide. The Dal is going to fly, come flying on that donkey. I have interpreted the donkey to be already here. Yes. <laughs> when I come to Malaysia, I have to travel on that donkey. Yeah. I have to travel on that donkey every time I come to Malaysia. Hmm? You can't get a ship anymore. No, they stop them. They only cruise liners now and you have to spend thousands of dollars. Only the rich travel by ship now. The rest of us, we have to use the flying donkey. And so, the Dajjal controls the sky. Because the flying donkey is not just the passenger aircraft. The flying donkey is also the fighter aircraft. The flying donkey is also uh, cruise missiles and so on. And so the Dajjal controls the sky. When war takes place, he quickly takes control of the sky. And once he controls the sky, it's only a matter of time. You can, you can continue to wage guerrilla warfare as they're doing in Afghanistan, but you cannot knock out the Dajjal once he controls the sky. The Jal is going to jump between <coughs> the Samawat and the earth, the skies and the earth, jumping up and down. It's going to be a very tall man to do that. If you're going to jump and your head is going to be in the sky, and then jump back down and your head, your feet on earth, I mean, you've got to be miles high as a human being to achieve that, eh? Well, then what does it mean? The Jal is going to be jumping between the heavens and the earth. Answer, this is symbolism. The Jal will have the technology 
would wish to be able to go up and come down. And you have that now in the shuttle, which goes up to the spy stations up there, eh? the military stations up there, up and down, up and down. Dajjal will step into an ocean and the water would reach up to his knee. You designed a picture already? <laughs> Dajjal is going to step in the ocean. I think after tonight's lecture, you've got a lot of work to do here in Urban Village. Dajjal is going to step into the ocean and the water will reach him to his knee. Protestant Islam, of course, is going to wait for a man who is tall enough so when he steps into the water, you'll see the water reaching him up to his knee in the ocean. But you and I know that this is symbolism. It represents the technology with which Dajjal is able to go down to the bottom of the ocean and pick up, for example, pieces of an aircraft which crashed and reconstruct that aircraft, maybe 95%. Hmm? They've done it already. The John is going to cut a man in half and then bring him back to life. So tomorrow when the John is in Jerusalem and he declares, I am the Messiah, Protestant Islam is going to tell him, come on, cut a man in half and bring him back to life. Let's see if you are the John. We say, no, this is symbolism. Dajjal is already doing that. Cutting a man in half and bringing him back to life represents the advancement, the spectacular advance that's been taking place in surgery. In surgery. Bypass operation, eh? cutting him in half and then bringing him back to life. Spectacular advances in the surgery. At the end of the day, the Prophet said, Alayhi Salaatu Waslam, the Jal is going to attack Medina. He's going to land outside of Medina on a marshy, salty land. And when that happens, every kafir and every munafik, disbeliever and hypocrite in Medina will be sent out or would leave to join Dajjal or pitched out of Medina to join Dajjal. But Dajjal will not be able to attack Medina because the angels are going to guard Medina. On that day when the Israeli army lands outside of Medina, Israeli Air Force and Armed Forces, and they're there camped outside of Medina, the attention of the whole world is going to focus on Medina on that day. Medina will be the center of the world on that day. And then the world will witness what Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu said 1400 years ago. The angels are going to divert his attack from Medina to Damascus. <coughs> And so the world will see the Israeli attack diverted to Damascus. And on that day, Medina will be once again in center stage in the world in Akhir Zaman. We have a little booklet at the back there, only 30 pages long or 35 pages long. Medina returns to center stage in Akhir Zaman. We have it in English, we have it in Bahasa. Please read it. When that attack is diverted to Damascus, Imam al Mahdi would be there in Damascus already. 
he would be in the masjid it would be the time of salat the, mas the masjid will have gates around it barricading it indicating a state of great uh, insecurity anarchy great violence so the masjid is barricaded and as the people are about to perform the salat perhaps salat will fajr and the imam is about to lead them in salat imam al-mahdi alayhi salam at that moment the jail will be outside waiting the prophet said that he be followed by 70,000 jews from isfahan wearing their persian shawls it is at that moment and not before that Nabi Isa Islam would return not a moment before the attack on Medina has to take place Israeli forces have to be outside of Medina the angels have to divert the attack to Damascus we have all of this detailed information what are we doing with it these are events that are going to be occurring soon another maybe 15 20 25 years from now at that time nabi isa -Islam will be sent back coming down from the sky with his hands resting on the wings of two angels <coughs> as he comes down in the masjid the imam will see him and the Imam would recognize him and the Imam will say this is Nabi Isa alayhi salam he would then invite Nabi Isa alayhi salam to lead the salat and Nabi Isa alayhi salam would say no you've been appointed as Imam you go ahead and perform the salat and he Nabi Isa alayhi salam will join in the saf and perform salat the way we, we perform salat as taught by Nabi Muhammad so the Sharia that came with Nabi Muhammad would be recognized by Nabi Isa and followed after the salat is over then Nabi Isa would order open the gates because the gates are locked and as the gates are opened and he comes out Dajjal sees him and the Prophet said that when Dajjal sees Nabi Isa alayhi salam Dajjal is going to melt like salt melts in water <laughs> indicating extreme fright and then Dajjal is going to flee so today they are stamping their bloody feet on the ground oppressing us but tomorrow they are going to be running you just have to wait hold on don't give up tomorrow they are going to be running and he's going to flee and Nabi Isa Islam is going to follow him pursuing him from Damascus to a place called Lud in the Holy Land and there Nabi Isa Islam will overtake him and kill him and then raise his hair to show the blood this is not symbolic this is where well. <laughs> this is where well. and that's the end of the job my opinion is that the Dajjal now passes into non-existence non-existence that's it he does not appear again in history in this world or in the next he passes into non-existence he's a special creation of Allah an evil creation can Allah create evil? Kul. Cool. 
أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق Yes, Allah can create evil This is a creation of evil by Allah No human being was created evil وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Every human being is honored by Allah By virtue of being a human being Dajjal is not honored <laughs> So Dajjal is not a human being Dajjal will appear in the form of a human being But you don't have to accept my view Remember that You do not have to accept my view Can an angel appear as a human being? Of course Jibra'il alayhi salam In the masjid As a human being Jibra'il alayhi salam With Maryam Alayhi salam Can a jinn appear as a human being? I know you're going to tell me lots of them in Washington <laughs> Yes Iblis Iblis appeared as a human being When the Quraysh were meeting to decide what to do about Nabi Muhammad Iblis appeared as an old man with a walking stick so if an angel can appear as a human being and a jinn can appear as a human being why is it so difficult to accept that the Dajjal can also appear as a human being hmm? and so there is no resurrection for Dajjal and there is no judgment for Dajjal and Dajjal is going to to neither go to heaven nor heaven rather you're going to pass into non-existence but these are my views and you must not accept my view unless and until you are convinced that it is correct you must listen to those who are critical of me and there are lots of them out there who are critical of me listen to them I ask you to listen to them but they say, don't listen to Imran Hussein. <laughs> we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless those whose appetite has now been wet. That you may study the subject of the job. For the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, that the greatest tests and trials that mankind will experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day will be the tests and trials of the job. There is a chapter of this book, Surah Al-Kaf in the Modern Age, entitled The Quran and Time. The chapter itself is long, about 60 something pages. But that, this chapter of the Quran explains to you the link between the Samawat and the Earth and the Jab. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين. Before we proceed, the subject of riba, the mountain of bread, is of critical importance. And you are lucky here in Kuala Lumpur because we've had two. International conferences on riba here in Kuala Lumpur in uh, 2010 and again July of last year hmm? at PWTC. And uh, there's a third conference which is now planned for late November of this year. Uh, I am supposed to speak on Islam the petrodollar and beyond in that, uh, in that lecture, um, conference uh, there are flyers at the back for those of you who are interested in attending that conference okay any more questions you have stressed the importance of walking on the path of Khidr alayhi salam and hence of Islamic spirituality to penetrate the subject of the Dajjal correct in Surah Al-Kaf, verse number 63, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded us of the effort of shaitan to cause us to be deviated from that path. Can you elucidate 
how can we protect ourselves from being deviated by shaitan and how can we differentiate between the irradiation of the light of inspiration from Allah and inspiration from shaitan it is sometimes difficult sometimes difficult it's not just shaitan it is also dajjal both of them how can we explain that the entire world of Islamic scholarship today is incapable of recognizing the paper money as bogus and fraudulent and haram how is it possible how is it possible that we who have been teaching this subject for the last 15 years have not succeeded those who are not ulama have readily understood and there are legions of people now particularly young people all around the world who recognize and accept this monetary system to be bogus and haram they have no difficulty in understanding but the scholars of Islam we have failed and we have failed miserably 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 how is it possible what's wrong the Islamic so-called Islamic banking system eh, is bogus it's fraudulent the Islamic banks will not ever 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 lift a little finger to bring back dinar and dirham as money no nope. ever heard an Islamic bank <coughs> Championing the cause of dinar and dirham? Not at all. <laughs> Islamic banks are lending money on interest. Islamic banks are lending money on interest. And disguising it as a sale. They call that Islamic banking. How come there are legions of Islamic scholars who support Islamic banking? How come? What is it? What's wrong? The Khilafa, the Khilafa is a political philosophy and political system which came with Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam who established the holy state of Israel that Khilafah was restored by Nabi Muhammad that Khilafah state recognized Allah as Al-Malik translation for Al-Malik sovereign Allah possessed sovereignty That Khilafah state recognized Allah as Al Akbar, whose authority is supreme. That Khilafah state recognized Allah's law as the supreme law, Al Hakam. No law is higher than Allah's law. When Allah made something halal, the state enforced it as halal. When Allah made something haram, the state enforced it as haram. That was the Khilafah state. And the territory was called Darul Islam. In Darul Islam, once the territory is Darul Islam, any Muslim has a right to enter. Any Muslim from any part of the world has the right to enter Darul Islam. You don't need a visa. Any Muslim can come and reside in Darul Islam. You have that right. You don't need a PR. Any Muslim can seek employment in Darul Islam. You don't need a work permit. 
And any Muslim can participate in the political process on the basis of political equality with all other Muslims. You don't need something called citizenship. That is what we had. And that is what is coming back with Nabi, with, with Imam al Mahdi. We just have a little time to wait. It's coming back. Our hearts are there with that. We have not forsaken it. We have never given it up. We have never betrayed it. No. We're longing for it to come back. And we'll struggle for it to come back. Even though we know we have to wait for Imam al Mahdi. But what about the rest? When the Jal destroyed the Khilafah state, guess what he used to replace it? <laughs> he used the modern secular state. And the whole world today is embraced by this system, which declares that sovereignty no longer belongs to Allah. This state is sovereign. Why can't they understand that that is shirk? What's wrong? What's wrong with Ikhwan al-Muslimun in Egypt? What's wrong with Party Islam in Kalantan? What's wrong with Jamaat Islami in, in Pakistan? What's wrong with Al-Nahda in Tunisia? What's wrong with the Justice and Development Party in Turkey? What's wrong with the world of Islamic scholarship? Why can they not understand that this is shit? Allah is no longer Al-Akbar. His authority is no longer supreme. No. The Charter of the United Nations Organization says that the authority of the Security Council of the United Nations is supreme in the world in all matters pertaining to international peace and security. Allah is no longer Al-Akbar. That shit. The modern secular state says Allah's law is not the supreme law anymore. The supreme law is the law of the state. Allah can make it halal, we can make it haram. And we've done so. Allah can make it haram, we can make it halal, and we've done so. And that is shirk. And yet, and yet, the Islamic movements register themselves as political parties under the secular constitution and fight elections man to man with everybody else vote for me <coughs> hoping to win the elections and when you win the elections by some abracadabra mystical sy sy system you'll be able to transform this into something called an islamic state i never heard of an islamic state in my life and i'm 70 years of age i don't know what's an islamic state and I don't want to know what's an Islamic State. Take your Islamic State and throw it in the garbage bin. Because I know what is Khilafah. And I know what is Darul Islam. And that is what is coming back. So how do we explain? Why is it that they can't see? Huh? Egypt just voted. Egypt just voted. Why can they not see what is wrong with the scholars of Islam in this modern age? Their failure has been so colossal. There's only one answer I can offer. Number one, methodology. <coughs> methodology for study. Number two, a proper study of Dajjal and therefore of modern Western civilization. And number three, to recognize a spiritual insight is still a medium through which knowledge can come to us. Are you saying that we are not allowed to go to a hospital? No, I'm not saying that. I go to the hospital. But I'm saying to you, be careful. You know, he had a heart attack. And they rushed him by ambulance to the hospital. And when they examined him, they decided they had to operate right away. Bypass. 
and they did triple bypass and as a consequence of that operation he's alive today if we had not taken him to that hospital and if he had not had the benefit of that operation he would have been dead that is the rubbish that is the nonsense that you must care for about because when you reach there you're worshipping Dajjal be careful because life and death is no longer in Allah's hands now life and death is now in the hands of the hospital and the doctor <laughs> and the life support machine don't turn it off if you turn it off he's going to die but so long as it's on the hospital making more and more money what to do if I turn it off he's going to die did you hear that if I turn it off he's going to die so life and death is now in that machine life and death is no longer with Allah it is this stupidness it is this stupidness that you have to be guarding against I don't say go to the hospital don't go to the hospital no but do not in the process commit the shit of believing that life and death is in the hands of a doctor or life and death in the hands of some medicine life and death in the hands of some hospital or some operator life and death are in Allah's hands what is your advice to Muslim students from Malaysia who are studying abroad in the United States, Australia, etc. Make Hijra, come back home before it's too late. Make Hijra, come back home before it's too late. If you cannot read history, I can. Oh yes. And I know what's coming up. Well, I think I answer this. Sir. We are trapped in this system of Dajjal with political parties. Why can't we restore our Khilafah state, beginning with an Islamic state here in our own country? Use the Dajjal system to beat his system. No, you can't use Haram to bring Halal. <laughs> no, this is not the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ did not insert himself in the pagan system of Makkah to try to bring Islam. No. He preached Islam in his purity and uh, offered Islam as an alternative to what Makkah had to offer. Makkah tried to bribe him. Makkah offered him wealth. Makkah offered to make him king. Makkah offered him the most beautiful girl in the whole land. If only you would compromise with our system. Live and let live. Use the system. And within this system pursue what you have to pursue. But his reply was no. Not even if you give me the sun in my right hand. And the moon in my left. I'm not going to give up this struggle. I'm not going to compromise and join yours. No, mine is the alternative to yours. So our Khilafah state is the alternative to what now obtains. We are not going to join this system and vote in this system to bring back the Khilafah state. That's Disneyland thinking. <laughs> That's Disneyland thinking. No. We're going to wait until, inshallah, we can restore the Khilafah state. And your modern secular state goes back in the garbage bin from where it came out in the first place. Is that all now? Whenever I do not have sufficient knowledge of a subject, I always decline to speak. And I send you to someone who has more knowledge of the subject than I have. I do not have enough knowledge of insurance 
to be able to give a scholarly response. But I do have enough knowledge to say I am not going to take any insurance. No, I avoid all insurance. I consider insurance to be the sister of riba. And it's only when the state forces me into insurance like motor car insurance that I cannot avoid. Then I take the motor car insurance until such time when my Muslim village is built. You have your urban village, I have my Muslim village. <laughs> and in my Muslim village, inshallah, you can't drive to the masjid. No, there are no roads to drive. There are only roads to walk. <laughs> so it's a pedestrian village. Huh? A pedestrian village. And everybody will walk into the masjid and walking back to their kampung homes. And we try to put the cemetery in between. <laughs> So, as you're walking to go and walking to come back, you remember one day you go in there, inshallah. Yes. So, I try to avoid all insurance personally. But that's my personal choice. Uh, the other question? What's wrong with studying there and actually <coughs> seek knowledge in whatever field that she's studying? Oh, she didn't have to leave. No Muslim has to leave, they can remain there. Okay? But when the war is start, which is starting soon, the Muslim is going to be targeted. And if you think the life of a Muslim in the United States has been horrible these last 10 years, as they say in Harlem and Brooklyn and Bronx, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> they have concentration camps already prepared to put Muslims okay you want to get out of the United States you cannot you want your daughter to come back here she cannot why no fly list <laughs> no, what? no fly list your name there you can't come on you can't She's trapped there. When the US dollar collapses, the economy will collapse. The economy collapses, there's going to be colossal loss of wealth. Of course, this is imaginary wealth, you know, the paper money. But people believe they're wealthy, they have millions and millions and millions, suddenly it vanishes. There are going to be riots in the United States. Riots. And when the riots take place, that's when the Zionists are going to have a field day. Paying people to go and take, attack Muslims. Destroy Muslim businesses. Destroy Muslim homes. Kill Muslims. Eh? To drive terror into the hearts of the Muslims. They wouldn't know what to do. When anarchy spreads, where are you going to get food? When there's anarchy and there's no electricity, no water, where are you going to get water from? Okay? This is tomorrow. If you cannot see it, I can see it. So I have been advising Muslims to get out, make hijra. It matters not to me whether you're there for studies or whether you're there to make, make what they call to make another buck under the American dollar. It matters not what be the reason why you are there. My advice is to make hijra before it is too late. But you don't have to accept my advice. No. Sorry, sorry man. Okay, okay, my question is regarding um, the fall of Greece, the economical collapse, uh, which you hear a lot of people are saying that it the first step towards the global economic crisis so if you don't mind sharing your views about that and how that might affect or later on you know um, how it will that effect uh, lead towards the, the, the coming of Dajjal and everything. Thank you. What we need 
is an honest banker. <laughs> if we can get an honest banker, a man of integrity and knowledge, who knows what the banks have done to put Greece in the condition in which Greece is today, okay? Then he will be able to spill the beans. In the last RIBA conference that we had at PWTC, a former, a former banker, senior banker came and spoke to us. And that banker spilled the beans and explained to us all the fraudulent transactions which are taking place in Islamic banking today that we did not know about and we would not be able to understand ourselves unless he explained and this is what he did okay in that conference so I have I am not a professional economist I have done studies in international monetary economics at two universities but I am not focusing my attention on the subject of how the banking system is operating to trap and to destroy a country. The reason why Greece is at the front row is because the banking system is under the control of the Jal, the Zionists. And the Zionists have their control in Western Europe. The Judeo-Christian alliance is in Western Europe. Western Europe has Roman Catholic religion and Protestant religion. But Eastern Europe is different from Western Europe. Eastern Europe had its capital in Constantinople and it was Eastern Orthodox Christianity and the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire and Eastern Christianity never joined the Zionists. <laughs> yeah? They never joined the Zionists. Russia for a time was controlled when the Soviet Union was constructed by the Jews. But then Allah's kindness and the Soviet Union collapsed. And in the wake of its collapse, Russia is returning back to Christianity. So this Eastern Europe from Christianity, from Russia come all the way down to Greece. This is considered to be alien territory for the Zionists. And if they could destroy you and damage you and choke you, they'll do it. That's why Greece has been targeted. But to understand the predicament of Greece, we have to go into the banking system and understand the tricks which were used by the banking system to put Greece where Greece is today. I think we can finish now. Ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu Tetapi aku 
tidak pula sanggup menanggung siksa neraka mu dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku ampunkanlah dosaku sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa dosa besar ilah ilah Allah fahab li